Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. And thanks for stopping by in 2014. It's appreciated. I trust the year's gone well so far. I'd like to thank uh, Nozifo Banjwa of CNBC Africa for having me on her show this morning. Thank you, Nozifo. Um, we've linked up, uh, we've put posted the entire Mindspeak presentation. I said a few words. Um, of course, Madame Lagarde made her speech. Uh, Vimal said more than a few words, and then we had a Q&A session. Um, so we've got that entire uh, footage uh, uploaded under Rich TV. If you fancy have a looking, having a look at that, I'll put up a photograph of Madame Lagarde with the, on the live feed that I took, and remind you of what I said. If Mind Speak was an ice cream sundae, then Christine Lagarde's appearance is like the maraschino cherry that you find on top of the sundae. In my view. Home thoughts. I will finish Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow this weekend. He is a remarkable, luminous writer of the 21st and 20th centuries and lifts the veil in an extraordinary manner. Political Reflections, Dr. Theodore Karasik has written in Al Arabiya, Why All Eyes Should Be on the Indian Ocean. Now that we are in 2014, many eyes will be focused on the Indian Ocean the Indian Ocean covers a vast area stretching from the coasts of East Africa in the west to Malaysia and Australia in the east to South Africa in the south. Its broader territory runs from the waters of the Arabian Gulf to the South China Sea, covers 70 million square kilometers or 20% of the world's water surface, hosts one third of the world's population, one quarter of the world's land mass, three quarters of global oil reserves, iron and tin, and over 70,000 ships cross it every year. Around 65% of the world oil reserves belong to just 10 of the Indian Ocean littoral states. The Indian Ocean hosts the world's most significant sea lanes of communication and, us, and as such plays a pivotal role in the global economy, in particular past 20 years. The world's major choke points are also located in the Indian Ocean. These are the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab el Mandeb and the Malacca Strait, creating brackets of troubles for seafarers, shipping companies and international security. A large portion of the global trade, most of Gulf oil en route to Asia, pass through these choke points. As such, they are strategically important for global trade and economic development. I'm saying that for a long time, the Indian Ocean was neglected. Sudden rise of India and China's global economic powers has significantly increased their energy needs and their dependence on the Gulf oil supplies, plus Africa, you might add to that. Saying that for quite a long time, the Indian Ocean has been largely dominated by the United States. Um, and saying that now its geostrategic and geoeconomic importance in the Gulf can be found in its vast, rich and diverse physical environment. And I was referring to this in a piece I wrote on the August 19th. I said a sine qua non of President Barack Obama's pivot to Asia is U.S. NATO power projection over the Indian Ocean. Professor Felipe Fernandez Armesto explains why the precocity of the Indian Ocean as a zone of long-range navigation and cultural exchange is one of the glaring facts of history made possible by the reversible escalator of the monsoon. I said on that, in that article, I have no doubt that the Indian Ocean is set to regain its glory days. China's dependence on imported crude oil is increasing and the U.S. is, interestingly, is decreasing. I am also certain that the eastern seaboard of Africa, from Mozambique through Somalia, is the last great energy prize um, in the 21st century. Therefore, the control of the Indian Ocean becomes kind of decisive, and with control, China can be shut down quite quickly. I'll put up a photograph of the Indian Ocean as seen in southern palms in Diani over the Christmas holidays. 
The United States apparently on Thursday said that new Chinese fishing restrictions in disputed waters in the South China Sea were provocative and potentially dangerous. The legislature of China's Hainan province approved rules in November that took effect on January 1st, requiring foreign fishing vessels to obtain approval to enter waters under its jurisdiction. Such a move, if broadly enforced, could worsen tensions in the region. Beijing claims almost the entire oil and gas rich South China Sea, rejecting rival claims to parts of it from the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. The fishing rules add another irritant to Sino US ties after China's recent announcement of an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea drew sharp criticism from Washington. The passing of these restrictions on other countries' fishing activities in disputed portions of the South China Sea is a provocative and potentially dangerous act, said the State Department spokeswoman. China has not offered any explanation or basis under international law for these extensive maritime claims. I'll put up a photograph of a handout photo showing two Chinese surveillance ships which sailed between a Philippines warship and eight Chinese boats to prevent the arrest of any fishermen in the Scarborough Shoal. I wrote about this on the 2nd of December, saying the pivot, of Asia, the pivot to Asia bears its fangs. This is obviously another response by the Chinese. I see the pivot to Asia as the encirclement of China and the shrinking of its operating theatre, and then lighting the tinderbox that is the periphery, and Xinjiang might well morph into China's Afghanistan. You will recall that the architect of Russia's defeat in Afghanistan was Zygmunt Brzezinski, and he remains a foreign policy eminence grease with the president's ear. The US probably feels it holds a decisive hard power advantage at this moment, and given that the trajectory is one of gradual erosion of that decisive advantage, leads me to the view that this pivot to Asia has a logic and a momentum of its own. Therefore, I see the US being increasingly determined to press its advantage. One might even posit that calming down the Iranian front allows the US to better concentrate its energies on the pivot to Asia. One of the key elements of the pivot to Asia is the air-sea battle concept. This concept envisages the battle beginning with a blinding attack against Chinese anti-access facilities and incorporates distant blockade operations. China's dependence on foreign oil is increasing just as the US's dependency is decreasing. And given my belief that the eastern seaboard is a fabulous energy prize, eastern seaboard of Africa, that puts the Indian Ocean in many respects right into the geopolitical frame. If you are considering distant blockade operations, one of those areas you will be blockading is this part of the world, given the amount of energy that is likely to be sold into Asia in the future. I'll put up a photograph of Hannah learning to windsurf at Southern Palms and on the Indian Ocean, which was like glass that particular morning. I have received some tweets from Binyavanga Wainana, um, and I'll just read four of them. An affordable cabbage and three bunches of sukuma is the contract that keeps people from burning Kenya. He says to me, you will be Egypted. Thirty boutique hotels will what? Create jobs? Two hundred new Java branches on the Thika Superhighway? Saying that Kilileshwa, which is where my school was at, Kenton, looks like Ali Mubarak's 2006 Alexandria bubble developments, taxi drivers with degrees hysterical with anger. Um, and uh, I met uh, Binyavanga with Nuruddin Farah 265 days ago. And I'm still not certain why I got fixed in his crosshairs this morning, but I referred him to an article I wrote on the 21st of October 2013, Africa Reflections on the State of the Now, I was saying that, you know, I was referring to the hopeless continent headline in The Economist and then less than 10, just over 10 years later, the Africa rising narrative. I said, clearly, what were once small pockets of acceleration have broadened out. Um, but the point to understand is that the African emergence is a relatively recent phenomenon. 
The challenge for many African governments is going to be of a very youthful population wanting it now. This new generation is surfing the 21st century via their mobile phones and their needs and wants are a multiple of any preceding generation. This new generation will reshape and force the reconfiguration of governments across Africa as they are forced to react to a new normal of heightened expectations among its citizens. I said an electorate can have heightened expectations but simply no leverage with which to pressure its government. Today the pressure points are growing exponentially. For three whole days during the Westgate crisis, the hashtag Step Aside Ole Lenku was the top trending hashtag in this region. I feel sorry for the cabinet secretary because I suspect some undiluted old guard elements probably whispered to say this and say that, with no regard or even comprehension of the new normal, and little regard for the fact that they were shredding the cabinet secretary's bona fides. I was talking about their mobile phone, how it's been a silver bullet and a game changer, very grassroots, anyone can own one, and therefore key uh, agent of change and precipitate of the new normal. Um, and uh, I, I was referring to the fact that both Ibrahim and the World Economic Forum had discovered that the rule of law and safety index in country, not cross-border uh, related, had deteriorated sharply. And I said this is signaling not an external challenge, but an internal fissure. Ibrahim said we should not rush into thinking that improvement will happen instantly. Don't forget it took China 40 years to get it where it is now. And I said, unfortunately, I know of no one who has a 40-year time horizon. And I concluded by saying these are interesting and fluid times. And that was my response to Binyavanga. The US has offered to help Maliki and so has Iran, Saudi Arabia's main regional rival. That shows how far the Saudi-American alliance has drifted since the early days of the Syrian war. The euro is firmer at 136.10, dollar index 1892. I said it was a trading star above 81. Um, Japanese yen 104.92, Swiss franc 0.9068, the pound 164.78. Aussie 0.8905, headed for a 0.5% loss this week. In your rupee 61.92, that's gained over the week. Korean won 1061.76, real 239.06. Egyptian pound 696.25, and part of it because they've lifted restrictions for Egyptians to transfer money out. Um, and the South African rent 1079.33, headed to 11. And the dollar has risen 4.9% in the past year. Uh, Euro 7.9, the yen third has fallen 13%. I'll put up a three month chart of the dollar index um, and uh, the 200 day moving average is at 81.52. That's a key level on the charts. We're some way away from it. Euro dollar uh, 136.10. I remain bullish with a 133.80 stop. Dollar yen 104.92. And you remember all last year I was saying we were going to enter this 105, 110 range. I think we're finally on the cusp of uh, entering that range. Gold, 1233.58, and as I said previously, I expect a breakdown at some point to $1,000 in 2014. Crude oil, 92.46, I wish I'd sold it above 100 just before the year end. It was really in nosebleed territory when it was there. The BBC is saying China's oil fears over South Sudan fighting. The stakes could not be higher for China, the largest investor in South Sudan's oil sector, as fierce fighting continues between forces loyal to Salvin Kiir, those of his former deputy. Um, some of the largest oil fields China operates um, are in areas controlled by fighters backed by Rik Machar, the country's vice president, until he was sacked in July. Oil production has already dropped by 20% since the onset of the conflict three weeks ago. More than 300 Chinese workers have been evacuated. The specter of their Libyan experience also weighs heavily on Chinese minds. China imported 1.9 million tonnes of oil, nearly 14 million barrels from South Sudan, twice as much as China imports from Nigeria each year. Um, though amounting to less than 1% of China's total imports, it makes up roughly two-thirds of oil exported by South Sudan. I wrote on the 30th of December, I think China would be wise to no longer count on South Sudanese oil. I said, I expect a hard power U.S. insertion into South Sudan under an R2P pretext, and I think China would be wise no longer to count on South Sudanese oil.
I did mention that in East Africa risks have metastasized um, as risk is going to do in this new century. South Sudan's army is advancing on the key rebel held centers of Bentu and Bor as rebels strengthen defenses in Bentu, says the BBC. Mozambique residents have fleed homes amid fears of a return to civil war. This is a headline in France 24. Fighting between government forces and rebels have been reported in several regions of the southern province of Inhambande. Our observer says that the latest outbreak of violence has driven panic stricken residents to flee their homes. Um, of course, uh, Shinzo Abe um, is paying a visit to Mozambique um, and uh, you know the, 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 the core reason is Japan's imports of natural gas for electricity generation have risen enormously uh, from Africa since the Fukushima incident um, and he's saying the development of natural gas is an extremely important matter for security and the national interest. The last visit by a Japanese leader to Africa took place in 2006. Since 2000 onwards, China's engagement with Africa has re-energized everyone else looking at the continent. Undoubtedly, the Japanese re-energized engagement should be seen in the context of countering the Chinese to an extent. I'll put up a photograph of the sunrise that I took from the Palana Hotel when we visited there last year. The South African all share bucking the generally bullish sub-Saharan African trend is down 1.73% this year. President Zuma reportedly said, I used to practice witchcraft around here, bewitching the birds during apartheid. Dollar versus Rand, as I said, last at 10.79. I'll put up a one month chart, it's got 11 written all over it. Egyptian pound versus the dollar, last at 6.96.25. I think that's all about the slight relaxation in money transfer rules. The Egyptian stock market is at a three year high and up 2.83% so far this year. The Nigerian all share up only 0.08% and I think some of the bull's enthusiasm has been tempered uh, in particular by the argument between the President of the Central Bank in Nigeria. The President asked the Central Bank Chief Lamido Senussi to resign over a leaked letter about missing oil funds um, and uh, in a heated exchange Mr. Senussi refused to leave his post before his term ends later this year. Mr. Sanusi said that about $10 billion was still unaccounted for by the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation and expressed surprise that those responsible were not being asked to resign instead. Fair point. Ghana Stock Exchange up 2.13% this year. Lions in South and East Africa. I love this picture of a lion, male lion in Botswana taken by Pete Oxford. Um, I wrote uh, over at the end of the year, Africa remains in a sweet spot. I said, I find that clarity of thought is a valuable thing in this hurly-burly world of ours. And I find clarity of thought at 35,000 feet and typically at the end of the year when I corral the family into the Nissan Patrol and drive down to Mombasa, preferably via the Sahara. The wide open spaces, the ochre landscape, the extraordinary green after four days of seasonal, but way above the historical moving average of rains, is like a canvas against which I can better focus on strategy because life is more than just tactics unless you are a day trader, which I am not. Galdessa has a star tent, and as I looked up at the stars, which looked so close, I felt like reaching up and touching. I cast my mind over the year. Plenty has happened, you would surely agree. I'll put up a photograph of the moon over Africa at 35,000 feet, taken at 3 a.m. Reference a, a quote by Doris Lessing, which I like, I was filled with such a dangerous, delicious intoxication. I could have walked straight off the steps into the air, climbing on the strength of my own drunkenness into the stars, the intoxication, as I know even then, was the recklessness of infinite possibility. I'll put up photographs of wild white, wild white flowers seen in Saba East. Another photograph of uh, a sunset at Lugard Falls on Christmas Day. And a link to an article I wrote in March last year, Africa's future is not seen in the rearview mirror. 
coming to Kenya, commercial banks posted 111.5 billion shillings of profit in the 11 months to November 2013, surpassing the full year performance for 2012. Expected, predicted, and predictable spreads. You can drive trucks through. South Africa's Tiger Brands acquires a Kenyan miller for 2 billion shillings. Um, they have uh, reached an agreement for the complete buyout of Rafiki Mills and Magic Oven Bakeries. Looking to get a presence in the local flour milling and bread baking business, and uh, this is after um, uh, they acquired 63.35 percent in Nigeria's Dangote flour mills. So you can see they're clearly positioning themselves in that space. I wrote an article on the 29th of July 2013 about Africa's buyout frenzy. Safaricom is plus 8.33 percent this year and is at a record high for the third consecutive session yesterday. Nakamad Westgate has received so far a billion shillings of compensation. They got their second tranche yesterday. I'll put up a photograph of Westgate seen from CNBC Africa's Nairobi Bureau 108 days ago. And also Nakamad had to finalize the ShopRite deal by April. Uh, set to complete a buyout of three Tanzanian outlets of South African retail chain ShopRite in the next four months. Dr. Mwangi is no longer with us. The new MD secretary told the Business Daily on Thursday he did not report to work this year. This is Sassini who briefly replaced their CEO. There's a link for Sassini's full year results and uh, share price data. Kenya shilling is at 86.609. The Nairobi All Share has had a huge start to the year, up 3.615%. I had a, ra I had a uh, rally um, of 5% in January. I think we might well get that. The NSE 20 is up 2.38% so far this year. The All Share rally 0.883% yesterday. A very powerful, muscular start to the year, up 3.615% and just 0.693% below an all-time high set on the 28th of November. NSE 20 closed above 5,000 for the second consecutive session. Safaricom set a record high for the third consecutive session um, and has underpinned the all-shares sprint out of the gates in 2014. ARM set a record for the second consecutive session. All the details are under rich wrap-ups, yesterday's performance, and today's performance will be posted at around 5 p.m. Kenya time, which is 2 which is 1400G. Once again, thank you for stopping by. Wishing you a super weekend and see you on Monday.